lot of people are anticipating earth changes of varying degrees of severity in the near future. A lot of people have got 2012 pegged as a date. Um, who knows? We've had predictions of severe earth changes come and go. Edgar Casey predicted an amazing range of earth earthquakes and tectonic changes which apparently failed to materialise. But the question remains in everyone's mind, what can we expect in the future in terms of earth changes, earth tectonics, the mega tidal wave, uh, the movies that people are producing? Well, in my opinion, one of the best ways to understand the nature of earth changes and tectonic plates, number one, is to understand the electrical universe theory because of the influence of the sun in its relationship to tectonic activity. But an equally important and emerging approach to um, understanding the Earth's uh, makeup and movements is the expanding Earth hypothesis. If you go onto the internet and you go to YouTube and you Google expanding Earth, expanding planets and expanding moons, you'll find that there's quite a few researchers who have done nothing else but take available scientific data from the public domain. In most cases it's the uh, age of the ocean bottom and they've plotted it and they've looked at it and they've just thought this does not compute with what we were taught in schools. So yet again we have another example of a branch of science where the information and the ability to process that information has raced ahead of where mainstream dogma is on the subject. Having said that, our next guest speaker, Dr James Maxlow, is a geologist with a special interest in Earth expansion as a more viable alternative to the widely accepted plate tectonics theory. Born in England, he migrated to Australia in 1953 with his family. He has a bachelor's and a master's degree in geology, PhD in global tectonics. He has over 35 years experience working as an exploration and mine geologist throughout much of Australia. Today he's based in Brisbane. Um, James argues that the theory of an expanding Earth fits better with the growing body of geological evidence. Just have a look at the map of the planet's bedrock with the youngest rocks located along the spreading mid-oceanic rift zones. James is the author of Terra Non Firma Earth, which is available at his stall, along with those very spectacular models showing the, the age of the Earth in increments. Uh, his book Terra Non Firma features many of his expanding Earth models. He's contributed several articles to Nexus. We had him speak at our conference in Brisbane, I think, in 2004. We had a few technical difficulties, so I didn't feel the audience was fully able to appreciate the, um, the amazing research he's put together. So obviously technology has moved forward. We've got better equipment. We've got a data projector that interfaces with the laptop here. So please give James another big warm Nexus conference welcome. James Maxlow, thank you. Thanks, Duncan. Always gives a wonderful introduction to um, Duncan. And I'm quite impressed, actually. In fact, I'm quite impressed with the audience here, how um, much you know, or you've all been introduced to um, what I'm going to talk about today. Duncan, he needs to be put on my payroll, I think. He uh, is very good. Um, so it's Earth expansion tectonics. Um, it's hard to imagine, hard to believe now that for many millennia, people um, were, were, were led to believe, the scholars, people, um, philosophers, etc., were led to believe that the Earth was the centre of the known universe. And everything, all, all the earthly bodies revolved around the, <coughs> around the earth. And uh, this was obvious. You wake up in the morning, the sun rises in the east, you watch it travel across the sky, set in the west here. Obvious. Yeah, nighttime, similar thing, the moon, the stars, etc., all migrate around the, uh, the earth. So it was obvious at the time that this is what happened. As well as this, there was much debate as to whether the Earth was, um, in fact, round or flat, as depicted in this um, little cartoon on, on the screen. And, of course, the uh, travelling to the ends of the world is still with us uh, these days, and uh, uh, many a mariner were uh, convinced that uh, if they travelled too far, they would fall off the edge, as depicted. Um, the underlying message here, of course, is that... Uh, um, philosophers and scientists at the time, that was their state of, the, state of knowledge. That was the limit of their knowledge that they had at the time. And these theories uh, were based on observation, their own observations and speculation. 
But things have moved on. We are 500 years uh, now ahead of those with a, an enormous uh, global database of information and technology uh, presentations such as this, uh, just unheard of, unthinkable in those days, of course. And um, so we must be prepared to uh, change our ideas, change our philosophies, and change our concepts to keep up with, with time. Underlying this, of course, is this uh, fundamental human premise that's um, it's, it's, it's an, uh, a, a mindset that the diameter of the Earth has remained constant with time. People don't even think about it, it just is. And I say, why? Um, the, um, the whole, my whole presentation, of course, is um, giving you uh, an un a, a brief introduction to all the evidence which suggests that, hey, the Earth is actually expanding. When I talk about expanding, I'm talking about 22, currently 22 millimetres per year. And for those uh, of, you, of you that are uh, well-travelled, um, overseas, etc., you can appreciate that you very easily lose 22 millimetres by the time you get to the other side of the world. For three quarters of the Earth's history, some 3,000 million years, 3,000 plus million years, uh, the actual rate of increase in radius that I've calculated is much less than the thickness of a human hair. So even at the 22 millim millimetres per year, when you distribute that across the entire size of the Earth, it's subatomic uh, sub scale. So there's no real um, threat to uh, human, mankind, etc., by uh, invoking a, um, an expanding Earth. So, uh, as I said, the title of my talk is Earth Expansion Tectonics. And when I talk about expansion tectonics, this encompasses um, uh, old uh, terminology. Uh, earth expansion, expanding earth, and also uh, a more recent term, growing earth. I use the term expansion tectonics to move away from those established uh, those terms and to bring it in the 21st century, uh, along with the uh, context of my data. So I'll be giving you a brief introduction to, as to what is expansion tectonics, um, also a brief historical introduction, mainly focusing on uh, researchers who have modelled um, small earth models, similar to the ones uh, of my own on display out in the, in the foyer there. Um, there are many others who have uh, philosophised about um, expansion, but it's the model makers that really make their mark. I'll also introduce you to uh, where is the evidence, uh, what to look for, uh, uh, what we see in the rock record, and, uh, and then uh, towards the end I'll speculate on uh, what does it all mean. So what is expansion tectonics? I've got a, a, um, <coughs> a short sentence there. To me, uh, expansion tectonics is a study of the structure and movement of the Earth's crust due to an increase in Earth radius. And as mentioned, this is only 22 millimetres per year, and the, the circumferential increase is about 140 millimetres. Uh, and this is distinct from um, the conventional plate tectonic um, um, idea, concept, that with a fixed radius Earth, uh, the continents simply randomly move around the surface of the Earth, wham bang, crash bang, um, a very random process with no structure, no evolutionary structure. The five models shown here uh, on screen are uh, scale models. Um, these are five of uh, a set of 24 models that I built as part of my PhD research study. Uh, 23 covering the, um, the Archean, which is the 4.5 billion years ago, uh, the beginning of geological time through to the present day, and then one <coughs> extrapolated to five million years in the future. I'll just dwell on a number of points here, uh, just a, a few introductory points um, that I need to get across to you to, just to understand the rest of my presentation. I'm going to talk about continental crust. This is distinct from oceanic crust, continental rocks versus oceanic rocks. Continental crust is of the order of 
30 to 100 metres, 100 kilometres thick. And these are predominantly made up of granites and volcanic rocks and metamorphic rocks and sedimentary rocks, all the rocks that we generally uh, are comfortable with. Up until, um, when was it, uh, even 20, 30 years ago, um, most scientists thought that the oceanic rocks, the oceanic seabed crust, was in fact oceanised continental crust. In other words, continental crust it was simply covered with water. And uh, so these concepts of you know, even plate tectonics and, and as well as expansion tectonics were um, very hard to comprehend by even scientists. Now we know that the uh, oceanic crust is actually made up of volcanic rocks. The, the vast majority of the rocks are basalt, a volcanic rock, and this crust is only of the order of um, 7 to 10 kilometres thick compared with the 30 to 100 from the continents. So you can visualise this, uh, an analogy is an egg. If you pump up that egg, uh, break the crust, um, the crust, the shell, sorry, shell is analogous to the continents. It's an analogous thickness and, and sort of broken up bits that you would get if you break up a continent. Um, the oceanic crust can be likened to the membrane and the gooey bits in the middle, of course, are the, the, um, uh, the core and, 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 and mantle. So this is a good analogy to get your head around. The other thing I want to impress on you is that the colours shown on this, these globes, and don't get stressed out on, as to what these uh, continental rocks and colours mean, but colours are intervals of time. Now, when we talk about geological time, we're referring to intervals of geological time. So this yellow stripe down here, for instance, is the Miocene Epoch. And it ranges in age from 6 million years to 23 million years. And similarly, the orange next to it ranges from uh, 23 to 37 million years. So all of the colours shown on these models are intervals of time. We can uh, date rocks uh, very precisely to the nearest couple of million years, which may not seem very accurate, but when you um, think of that in relation to the actual age of the rocks, it's sort of something like 0.1, 0.2% accuracy. Uh, so, but they're spot, uh, spot ages. Uh, all of geology is um, governed by this intervals of time. Oh, the other thing that um, I need to impress on you is this first model here. Um, it covers 4.5 billion years ago to around about, say, 1.6 billion years, which is around about 75% of Earth history. So uh, while it looks, when you look at these models, it looks like a linear increase in radius, it's actually an exponential increase. So it's flat lines and then gradually or rapidly increases to uh, a, a steep incline. So this model here on this scale would be something out here in the middle here. Um, and then so a flat, very flat, gentle curve and then increasing it. So the rate of increase in radius on this first model is, as I mentioned, less than the thickness of a, much less than the thickness of a human hair, uh, ranging up to 22 million uh, 22 millimetres, 22 millimetres per year for this current model. Um, so, <coughs> historical, uh, the, the um, uh, his researchers that uh, uh, um, have been very important in uh, expansion, Earth, Earth expansion and expanding Earth theory in the past, most important was Ott Christoph Hilgenberg in, in the 1930s. Now, to me, Hilgenberg was a, a very brave man. Um, he obviously looked at the Earth and thought that if I take away these, these oceanic crusts, what happens to the continents? Can I fit them together on a much smaller Earth? Now, this is a time when it, you know, people were not aware that continents could move, let alone the Earth could expand. So uh, why or how he came across this, I just do not know. He, no, he was actually probably 70 years ahead of his time. 
and hence he was shunned and, and uh, his modelling was uh, neglected for, for many, many years. What he did was simply take these uh, uh, continental outlines and visually fitted them together and came up with a, with a model, a small earth model, roughly 55% of the present earth. He's um, focused on the Atlantic Ocean, South America and, and Africa, um, and uh, mainly because um, uh, map makers, Dutch map makers in particular, uh, their maps date back to say the 1600s uh, where they noted, the map makers themselves noted the similarity in uh, continental outlines between Africa and South America and North America and postulated that okay this may have been, uh, these may have been joined together uh, in, in the distant past. And of course this has then formed the basis of conventional plate tectonic theory. Moving on, uh, Klaus Vogel from uh, Verdot in uh, East Germany. Um, he was active in the 1980s and um, he's a civil engineer. Uh, in fact, these, the models on the table are actually my models um, and his are uh, uh, portrayed in the background there and a, and a very famous model of his of a, a globe inside a globe. He was able to uh, refit all the continents back to the same as um, Hilgenberg did in the previous one fit them back and then put them inside a globe. So you can actually see uh, uh, the relationship of the continents as from then to now. Um, Klaus was um, fortunate that his model making was uh, coincided with the um, commencement of, of mapping of the oceans. And uh, my models coincided with completion of the mapping of the oceans. And I took all of my models, these models were uh, handmade by my wife who's in the audience and manning the booth at the moment. We compared and contrasted our models and we were very, very close and it was, very, it was, a, it was a great feeling of confidence to see that Klaus, independently of myself, we didn't know each other at the time, came out with, uh, with models that were very close and very similar. So um, Klaus is now in his, his 80s now, so he's um, winding down, but uh, still active, but winding down. Um, and of course myself, I've taken over from both of these, um, these researchers. So I move on, where is the evidence? And um, <coughs> as a geologist, uh, the evidence basically is everywhere and it is preserved in what I call the rock record. Uh, if I pick up a rock, um, I know the language of geology so I can read a lot of information, I extract a lot of information out of that rock. In fact, you can do a PhD on a rock. I wouldn't like to do it, but you can certainly do a PhD on a rock. There's that much information in it. But you have to know the language of rock, the language of geology. It's like um, getting hold of, a, of a, a book written in Germany, a German or something like that. If you don't know the German, you can't read the book. If you don't know the language of rock, you can't read that rock. Other evidence, of course, is in geophysics, um, using specialised instruments to measure various properties of the rocks. Uh, geography, the study of the ancient land surfaces, and biogeography, bio the study of the animals that lived in those ancient land surfaces. So we'll just progressively go through each of these and uh, start talking about things. So the geological evidence. Now this is a uh, photo micrograph of a volcanic rock which happens to be basalt. Now this is, uh, imagine a very, very thin slice of rock uh, glued onto a glass slide, like similar to what doctors do with their biological samples. Um, you grind it very, very thinly and you look at it under the microscope and this is what a basalt looks like, a volcanic rock. And this scale is probably, you're looking probably uh, two, three uh, two or three centimetres uh, across the field of view there. And this is a, um, an olivine basalt. I know this is, this is olivine because this is olivine minerals, these two big ones here, and similarly these dark blue ones here, but that's irrelevant. Um, the other lath-like uh, minerals are plagioclase, which is a felspar. These are sort of basic things you learn in Geology 101. Um, and when you weather or oxidise and weather felspars in particular, 
they form clays, and clays are, of course, are very important in the ceramic industry. What I've put this up uh, on the screen for is these, uh, show you these little black grains down here. And this is magnetite, and most many of you in the audience will be well aware of the properties of magnetite. This is magnetite in its natural form, natural crystalline form, and it is common in this basaltic volcanic rocks, which forms the majority of rocks in the ocean seafloor. <coughs> These magnet, uh, uh, magnetite crystals have very uh, measurable properties. When you cool that lava below 500 degrees uh, Celsius, um, these grains of magnetite start to crystallise and uh, establish their, their, their magnetic uh, polarity. Now, when this material crystallises in a, in, a, in a hot liquid mush of minerals around it, these minerals align themselves up to the ancient North Pole. All of these will, will point to the ancient North Pole. By taking a sample of this rock, you can then subject it to uh, these very um, sophisticated instruments, very uh, delicate instruments, and you can actually uh, measure what we call the declination. So the direction that, that those little magnets are pointing to uh, represent the ancient um, pole, North Pole. So you get a, an angle from the present North Pole, which is that way, not that way, present North Pole to the ancient North Pole, so that becomes your declination. The other property of, of magnets is that you also measure the inclination, so the angle from the horizontal, so you have a declination and an inclination. And what the inclination is, if you have a compass or, or this was solidified at the equator, the inclination is zero, it's horizontal. It's trying to point to both North and South Poles. If you then uh, go to the North Pole with your compass or something or other, then your, your, your compass needle would be vertical, because there it is, there's your North Pole. That's what it's trying to find, so it will point directly to the, to the, to the North Pole. And so by measuring this angle of inclination, you can actually calculate um, the latitude the ancient latitude. So there's two pieces of information from this this uh, this this uh, one image, one slide. You can measure the declination. So uh, somewhere in that direction there, if you travel far enough, you will get to where the ancient pole, North Pole, was. And having an inclination, you can say, okay, um, I'll, I'll limit that distance to X number of uh, degrees of latitude. So that forms the basis of, of the rest of my talk here. Um, now this is a schematic um, of a section of um, the North Atlantic Ocean. And this is ge ge getting onto geophysical evidence. Um, during the Second World War, uh, instruments um, called magnetometers were invented, and these magnetometers measure magnetism, of course, and they were developed to uh, detect submarines under the ocean. So they were dragged behind ships or, or um, dragged behind aeroplanes, low-flying aeroplanes, to detect a magnetic response from these uh, submarines. Later on, after the war finished, uh, the oceanographers got onto these instruments. In fact, we now use it quite um, religiously for land-based uh, surveys. Um, I had a what we call an ultra detailed magnetic survey that I did um, in the West Australia there, an aeroplane flying at um, 25 metres above ground level, um, taking a, a measurement every five metres or something like that, and then coming back, moving across another 25 metres and doing another survey. That's the precision and accuracy they can measure these things now. Anyway, getting back to this, this is uh, when they <coughs> sailed uh, their ship trailing this magnetometer across, back and forth across the oceans. They came up, came up with these characteristic uh, zebra stripe like anomalies. So, what's shown here in the colours is uh, normal magnetic polarity. So, in other words, um, all the little grains of magnetite within that, uh, the, the, that coloured stripe all point to the North Pole. Next to that, we have a white stripe or they all point to the South Pole, so the North Pole was then the South Pole, and the reversal again. So this is around about, on average, about 700,000, 
thousand years the, the change of uh, change of polarity. I think you've all heard of, about this. What uh, the survey also showed when they came back and if you uh, have a, a drill from a ship, you drill into the into the, the seafloor bed, take a sample of that rock, you can age date it. And what they found was that we had a central mid-ocean ridge, and this is a, 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 a very large, very long uh, mountain range at the middle of each of the oceans, and it's something like, we now know that there's something like 60,000 kilometres length. Um, now, uh, the age of these rocks in the middle were present day, and then the further away you go, um, the ages become older as you move away from this uh, mid-ocean ridge. Um, and the other thing they noted is parallelism of these stripes is that um, this stripe here equals, time-wise, this equals that stripe there, and similarly that stripe equals that stripe. And as I mentioned, they're all ageing away from that central ridge region. So you take this a step further and you move back in time. So by moving back in time, uh, what the researchers came up with is if you move back in time, all this material must be returned back to the mantle where it came from and the crusts must be brought together and by inference the continents must be brought closer together they're actually now moving away from each other away from this ridge so the next schematic up here shows uh, it, the, the, the removed these um, three stripes here and united this stripe and this stripe as the mid-ocean ridge similarly move these remove these three stripes and you get this stripe and this stripe equaling the mid-ocean ridge. And so this might be a period, uh, an interval of maybe 10 million years or something like that. And this forms the basis of my modelling work. <coughs> um, so in the next image, what, uh, what, what the uh, map makers have done is cluster or group these um, stripes, these magnetic stripes, into age, uh, geological age stripes. So, um, this is the final map that um, UNESCO and then the Commission for the Geological Map of the World have come up with, published in 1990. And that uh, previous schematic is located about here in the North Atlantic. Um, they extended that survey down to the Atlantic and demonstrated that uh, the Atlantic Ocean is opening up. And this is now measured. We can measure with satellite technology. We can actually measure the rate of opening, which is about one to two centimetres per year. Um, so what's happening along that mid-ocean ridge is that as the, it's, it's essentially a, a big crack in, in the ocean sea, sea floor bed, and, and which extends all the way around the world. Nothing to worry about. Um, so as this crack opens up, Lava, the magma from uh, from the mantle is injected along this this uh, fracture, and as it uh, hits the uh, ocean waters, it quench. It's been quenched and solidifies. Uh, continued opening, it cracks, opens again. More magma, crack seal, crack seal, crack seal over an extended period of time. So that's the fundamental basis of what's happening in the the um, ocean floors. Now, um, they postulated, speculated that the Atlantic Ocean is opening up. Um, uh, Africa is moving away from South America and Europe is moving away from North America. And the um, governing um, premise at the time uh, was, of course, this constant Earth uh, uh, premise. If you have material being uh, generated here, being ejected and uh, um, opening up the oceans here uh, and moving the continents apart, we must dispose of it somewhere else. And that's the, 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 the concept of plate tectonics, conventional plate tectonics, is material from the Atlantic Ocean is being disposed of in subduction zones around the Pacific Ocean. I'll go into that. Um, what the mapping showed was, as well as the Atlantic Ocean, each of, and all of the other oceans contain a mid-ocean ridge and all of the oceans are also... Open.